we continue to attempt to be better equipped to proclaim Christ from the Old Testament scriptures, we want to continue to follow the outline that Jesus himself presented, recorded in Luke 24, on the day that he was risen from the dead. Jesus spoke to his disciples and he told them, when he opened their minds to the scriptures, everything that Moses and the prophets and the Psalms said about him. And in particular, he said that the scriptures themselves bore testimony to the fact that the Christ would suffer, that he would rise again from the dead, that he would enter into his glory, and that repentance for the forgiveness of sins would be proclaimed in the name of Christ to all the nations, beginning from Jerusalem. As we've begun looking at the first of the five books of Moses in the book of Genesis, our previous video looked at the first explicit gospel presentation, which was made by God himself in Genesis chapter 3, verse 15. The next explicit gospel presentation will again be made by God himself, this time to Abram. But in between these two passages, an account presents itself that should be taken allegorically. Now, I know that for some of you, that might make you nervous. In fact, allegorical interpretation of the Bible can be very dangerous if it is done without any restraint. If we simply take every passage in Scripture and treat it allegorically, we can literally make the Bible say anything that we want to, which is very dangerous indeed. To be very clear, I am not suggesting that we just take whatever passages we desire and attempt to shoehorn Jesus into them by preaching them or teaching them allegorically. Instead, I'm suggesting that we take Noah and the ark allegorically because the New Testament itself appeals to this imagery and helps us to understand in particular something that is very misunderstood in our own day. By understanding this connection, we can better understand Jesus as the ark of salvation. And in so doing, we can be better equipped to proclaim repentance in his name to all the nations. In speaking of the coming judgment, Jesus appeals to the judgment that happened in the days of Noah. He says this, And just as it happened in the days of Noah, so it will be also in the days of the Son of Man. They were eating, they were drinking, they were marrying, they were being given in marriage, until the day that Noah entered the ark, and the flood came and destroyed them all. Jesus instructed his people to think about the future judgment in terms of the previous judgment. Although the exact terms of judgment will not be the same, it is helpful to understand that the life leading up to it will be very similar. Just like there were many who were caught surprised in the days of Noah when the floodwaters came upon the earth, there will be many who are caught surprised when the Son of Man returns in glory to gather his people to himself from every tribe, every tongue, every nation, and every people, and to crush his adversaries under his feet. Just like in the days of Noah, when salvation was found by being hidden safely in the ark, likewise, salvation will only be for those who are hidden in Christ on the day when God's righteous wrath is revealed. The second reference that's important for us to consider is made by the Apostle Peter. The Apostle Peter refers to the imagery of Noah in the ark and uses it allegorically. If we understand the correspondence from what Peter is saying to this account in Genesis, then we'll better understand what Peter himself is saying, which, if we don't understand it, is one of the most controversial passages in the New Testament. For Christ also died for sins once for all, the just for the unjust, so that he might bring us to God, having been put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the Spirit, in which also he went and made proclamation to the spirits now in prison, who once were disobedient when the patience of God kept waiting in the days of Noah during the construction of the ark, in which a few, that is, eight persons, were brought safely through the water. Corresponding to that, baptism now saves you, not the removal of dirt from the flesh, but an appeal to God for a good conscience through the resurrection of Jesus Christ, who is at the right hand of God, having gone into heaven after angels and authorities and powers had been subjected to him. This passage in Peter's epistle is often twisted. It's often abused. It's been used to say that the act of water baptism is necessary for salvation, attempting to add to what Christ has done in his completed work on behalf of all of those who humbly repent and put their faith fully in him, not in anything that we do, but in what he has already done. Some would say, how can you deny that baptism is necessary for salvation? It says it right here in the text. But again, this is why it is important for us to understand what Peter says. Look again at verse 21. Peter says, corresponding to that. 
he is using an allegorical understanding of what happened with Noah and the ark. If you were to sit down and read both of Peter's epistles, which I encourage you to do, it won't take you that long, you'll see that Peter, in both of his epistles, appeals to Noah. In 2 Peter, he tells us that Noah was a preacher of righteousness. Here in this particular passage, he says that the Spirit of Christ indicated to those in Noah's day that judgment was coming and that salvation was in the ark. Some would say, well, this is an indication that Christ went down to hell and made proclamation to people who are in hell and so many other various things. But again, if you just read this entire epistle on its own, you'll see that in chapter 1, Peter speaks of the prophets that the Spirit of Christ in them had been indicating things all along. If we take the Bible at face value, it is a book that claims to be inspired by God, that the Spirit of God, the Spirit of Christ, the Holy Spirit, the three persons of God have been inspiring individuals not to write down their opinions, but to proclaim the glory and excellencies of God all along. As Noah was a preacher of righteousness, he was proclaiming, bearing testimony in line with what all of the prophets have been doing all along. And in his day, in his generation, the Spirit of Christ in Noah, while Noah was preaching, was bearing testimony to that generation which failed to heed the call. Now think for a second about how most evangelism happens in our day. Most people think that we should just tell people information about Jesus. But think if you were in Noah's position, that God had told you that judgment was coming, that the flood was going to come upon the earth, and he gave you a plan for salvation, a plan to build an ark so that in the ark you could be saved. If you knew that people could be saved by being hidden safely inside the ark, would you think that it was okay to simply go around telling people information about the vessel that you were building? I don't think so. It wouldn't be enough to get people to memorize the dimensions of the ark. It wouldn't be enough if they simply knew the fact that it was made from a particular type of wood or that it was covered with pitch or the size of the windows or anything else. The only way they would be saved wouldn't be about memorizing facts and information, but it would be being hidden safely inside the ark when the waters came upon the earth. In fact, if you were to read this story for yourself, from Genesis chapter 6 to Genesis chapter 10, you'd see that in Genesis chapter 7, God put Noah and his family safely in the ark. He told them to enter into the ark and literally be immersed in the ark of their salvation. In our day, we make so many presuppositions about terms. We hear that term baptism that Peter's using and we immediately think of the sacrament or the rite or the ordinance of dunking someone in water. And to be clear, that is an ordinance that is described in Scripture, that for all who believe upon the Lord Jesus Christ and truly repent and put their faith in Him, they should be baptized in obedience to what He has commanded them. And we do that as a symbolic act to represent our participation in His death and His burial and His resurrection from the dead. But what Peter is speaking of here in his epistle is saying that when we appeal to God, when we repent and put our faith in Christ, that we are, it's not about being dunked in water, the removal of dirt from the flesh, but that appeal to God for a clear conscience immerses us in Jesus as the ark of our salvation. Baptism is a Greek word that is simply transliterated into English. We've borrowed that from the Greek language, baptisma. And baptisma simply means to immerse or to dip. Now, we could be immersed in water or dipped in water. That's true. We call that water baptism. But as Peter is using this imagery, he says corresponding to what we saw in Moses, in the book of Genesis, when Noah and his family were brought safely through the waters of judgment by being hidden inside the ark, that corresponding to that, allegorically speaking, metaphorically, understanding that Jesus Christ is the ark of salvation and we must be baptized, immersed in him. If you were to read the book of Ephesians chapter 1, it speaks of the work that God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit have done in order to put believers in Christ. In fact, there are two Greek prepositions that are different in the original language that our New Testament was written in that are translated with the same English word in, I-N, that sometimes causes confusion. A great example is found in one of the most uh, 
in one of the most famous passages in all the New Testament, in John chapter 3, verse 16. To give you an idea, before we read this passage, and we need to read the few verses leading up to it, John 3, 14 to 16, I want to just explain to you the difference between these two Greek prepositions. The first is ace. It's translated in in English, but ace has a directional idea. If I were to call my wife on the phone and say, honey, I'm, I'm heading into the grocery store now to get those items that you requested, then I am. I'm using the English word in, but with a directional idea. My wife would understand from the context that I am not yet inside the store, but I'm heading in that direction, that I'm moving in that particular direction. Likewise, a few minutes later, when I inevitably have trouble finding the items that she sent me there for, I'll once again call my wife and say, honey, I'm in the store and I need help. Now, the context, even though I'm using the same English word, I'm using a different Greek preposition, n, instead of ace, n, which is no longer pointing in a direction, but is talking about a location. If we understand what Peter was saying, that corresponding to Noah and the ark is how, when we appeal to God, that we receive salvation, not the washing away of, wa uh, of dirt from our flesh by being dunked in water, but truly repenting and putting our faith in Christ, then we become immersed in Christ. He becomes the ark of salvation. We now understand these two different ideas. And as Christians, as followers of Christ, as we understand that the Old Testament is being used to help us to understand and be better equipped to proclaim Christ in the world, as we go and proclaim repentance for the forgiveness of sins in the name of Christ, it is not enough for us to simply go into all the world and proclaim information about Jesus. We don't just simply go into all the world and say, let me tell you my favorite story about a miracle worker who walked along the plains and the shores of Galilee back 2,000 years ago. One time he fed multitudes with a few loaves and a few fishes, or he healed the sick and he performed miracles. I don't want to simply just go into the world and proclaim information and get people interested any more than Noah, as a preacher of righteousness, would have preached information about the ark. Instead, we need to be proclaiming repentance for the forgiveness of sins, that people would not be going on eating and drinking, marrying and taking in marriage, living as if judgment isn't going to come upon the world soon but instead to turn from living for their own selves, living for, them, for their own priorities and doing what seems right in their own eyes and appealing to God for forgiveness in Christ and trusting in Him as the ark of their salvation. In John chapter 3, verses 14 through 16, we'll see both of these prepositions in action. And in fact, this is very consistent throughout the New Testament, the way that this is used corresponding to how Noah would have been proclaiming to anyone who would listen that they should turn from their own wicked lifestyle and flee into the ark to be found hidden inside the ark. Likewise, we should be, as followers of Christ, proclaiming repentance for the forgiveness of sins in His name, telling people that Jesus is the only name given under heaven by which we can be saved, that they must turn from living for themselves, they should turn from doing what seems right in their own eyes, and flee to Christ to be found hidden in Him on the day of judgment. In John chapter 3, verse 14, the scripture says, As Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness. There's that English word in. That's the Greek preposition, en, location. They were in the wilderness. Even so must the Son of Man be lifted up. Verse 15, so that whoever believes will in him have eternal life. Once again, that's en, the location. For those who are in Christ, they will have eternal life. Verse 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. In this verse, it's not N, the location, but ace, directional. That whoever believes into him will have everlasting life. Christians, as we understand what the Old Testament tells us, we look at the account of Noah and the ark not simply as a story to be told in children's church about the animals two by two happily going into the ark, but we use this as a corresponding example that just as judgment came in the days of Noah, so it is going to happen again in the coming of the Son of Man. As Christians then, we go into all the world and we proclaim repentance for the forgiveness of sins in His name. That Jesus is able and willing to save all who come to him in humble faith. But people must turn to him, 
Not simply understand information about him or have a favorite story about him from the Gospels, but must truly flee and be found hidden in Christ on the day when God's righteous wrath is revealed. Thanks for watching, everybody. If you enjoyed this type of content, don't forget to click the thumbs up button and consider subscribing so that you won't miss our future videos.